we began a series on um, the gifts of the Spirit. And we talked about concerning spirituals, concerning manifestations of different measures of the Spirit in our life. And so tonight we will actually begin to take a look at, at some of the gifts, one gift in particular. But let's go over to, to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and let's just read um, the, the list of the gifts there in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul, Paul addresses them. The church at Corinth in chapter 12, and he says, uh, I'll start with verse 7. Verse 7 again says, but the manifestation of the Spirit. Remember over in verse 1 of chapter 12 last week, we talked about where it says, now concerning spiritual gifts, the word gifts is italicized. So it's really, in the Greek, it's now concerning spiritual manifestations, manifestations of measures which might, a measure would manifest in your life or a person's life at any given time, depending upon the measure that's in them, understanding that it's all fluid, and we have different measures of the Spirit in our lives at different times. So he says here in verse 7, The manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. The Greek says, But to every man that there's a manifestation given, it's given to profit everybody. Now he goes and he lists the nine gifts. We're going we're gonna, to... Uh, read them, then I want to show you how a good way to help you remember them. Verse 8, For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. Interesting that it takes knowledge to have wisdom, but they're two different gifts. And we'll talk about how that works, how, how they're two different gifts. Um, verse 9, To another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts, gifts plural, of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. Notice that doesn't say the gift of discernment. A lot of people say they got the gift of discernment, and what they mean is they nitpicking and judging you. But that's not a gift for you to judge me. It's the discerning of spirits to see into the spirit world. We'll talk about that later. Discerning of spirit to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. We're going to start there tonight because these are, the Bible tells us plainly, are the least of the gifts, but yet they're the most controversial. They're the most misunderstood. Verse 11, but all these work of that one and self-same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Okay, so we just read nine gifts of the Spirit. Let me tell you a good way to uh, remember those. And before I do that, let me show you all this before I even get started. I, I like the, uh, for a teacher to give me some, uh, you know, when you're in Bible college, they give you some things to read. So I want to show you all, if you're interested in studying on your own these gifts of the Spirit, I brought two sets of books that I have found to be the best theologically. This is the Holy Spirit 1 and the Holy Spirit 2. They're by Reverend Alex Ness, N-E-S-S. If any of y'all ever want to get some of these books to look at, these are, you can't go to the bookstore and buy them. They're out of print, but you can get on Amazon and uh, some of the other websites and, and find them. The Holy Spirit, Volume 1, Volume 2, Alex Ness, this guy is a real theologian, and he will take you as deep as you want to go uh, in concerning everything. This is about the gifts, the, who the Holy Spirit is, how he indwells you, the fruits of the Spirit. He goes into every name in the Bible that's a, that's a, a type of the Holy Spirit. It's just a very interesting study, and it is that, a study. And this is, if you want a simple read, uh, this is a, one of the best little lesson books that I've found on the Holy Spirit and His gifts by Kenneth Hagin, who's deceased now, uh, but it's 26 lessons on the Holy Spirit. And I think in this form, he has a big book. I'm looking at y'all because y'all graduated school. He has a big book called The Holy Spirit, which is basically the same. But this one cuts the chase and gets to the gifts a little quicker. And you can also, it's, they're not printing this, I don't think, but you can also buy it. On Amazon, it's just called "Concerning Spiritual Gifts: Twenty Six Lessons on the Holy Spirit and His Gifts" by Kenneth E. Hagen. 
Uh, so uh, I recommend if you're going to get one of the two, unless you're a real deep, thick reader, the other one's a real, real college course type book. This is an easy read right here, but it gets to the point. So um, uh, Concerning Spiritual Gifts by Kenneth Hagin. Okay, let's start talking about these gifts. Um, here's, here's a good way for you to remember this. Think about what I'm going to say and log it in your mind, and then you'll see that we will unfold this the next few weeks ahead. There's nine gifts. There's nine fruits. There's nine gifts. Uh, the nine, who am I looking at? Lord have mercy, come give me a hug. Yes, I want a hug from you. Y'all just excuse me. I hadn't seen. Oh, oh my goodness. Oh, it it's been four years, almost four years. You look so good. Y'all excuse me. This is personal for me and her. Well, thank you. <laughs> you look so good. Well, thank you. Her deceased husband was just one of my best friends and the elder here. And we miss him. Oh, oh, I miss him too, of course. Well, well you in Carolina. I am glad to be Y'all excuse me, I had to do that. I just realized you're sitting there. You, you've lost so much weight. Did y'all know that was Joyce sitting there? No, she looks like she's 30 again, don't she? If Kevin could, I mean, if uh, Kevin, listen to me. If Kevin could talk to you now, he'd say, Wow, why don't you look, you sure look good now and I'm gone. I'm Oh my, I'm sorry y'all, I had, that just, that, I'm just thrilled that you're here, that just blew me away. So there's three, listen to this, nine gifts, there's, uh, let's categorize them this way, nine gifts divided into three groups, think about it, nine gifts divided into three gifts, there's three that say something, there's three that reveal something, and there's three that do something. Three to say something. Three to say something. Remember this. The, uh, and, and I know I'm, it's just, this is a class, y'all. It's not a church service. I'm teaching you a class. It's a little different. But three to say something would be um, the gift of tongues, the interpretation of tongues, and prophecy. They say something. Three that reveal something, three that bring a revelation would be what? The word of knowledge, the word of wisdom. And the discerning of spirits. The three that do something would be, of course, the gift of faith, the gift of healings, and the working of miracles. So you've got three that say something, three that reveal something, three that do something. In your mind, look at them in that, in that grouping. Uh, tonight we're going to pick up the least of the gifts, which is the gift of tongues. But tongues is such a, such a vast subject because not all tongues that's in the believer's life is the gift of tongues. And one has to understand the difference in you speaking, praying in tongues and someone who operates in the gift of tongues. They're for two different reasons. I'm going to show you... Tongues for you is uh, for your edification. The gift of tongues is for the church's edification. One's personal, one's public. And then, and then if you want to complicate the issue of tongues even more, think about it. There's the gift of tongues. There's the, there's the initial evidence that one has been baptized or filled with the Holy Spirit. That's a tongue. There's when the Holy Spirit kicks you into intercession and prays through you, according to Romans chapter 8. There's when you do your personal prayer. There's worship. So, you, there, I mean, I can go on. Paul even talks about blessing your food in tongues. He really does. So, you, when you talk about tongues, you've got to have enough understanding to differentiate. And, and so, I'm going to go in tonight. I'm going to go into... Uh, chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians, and try to clear up some confusion. There's so much confusion over, especially these verses of Scripture in chapter 
14 of 1 Corinthians that it divides major denominations. And, and I think that it's simple. I think that it's clear. And that the whole issue is when we're reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and we're reading how it's, how it's uh, governing and regulating tongues, that we have to distinguish properly whether it's talking about the gift of tongues, personal tongues, public tongues, private tongues. And to complicate the matter even more, you'll see as we read, Paul will flip from, in the same verse, he'll flip from public tongues to private tongues and not even differentiate between them. Because he's coming from the background, and you should understand what I'm, what I'm talking about. But, but uh, can, can we just go there and, um, and, and read? But even before we go there, I want to address this. Before, uh, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now, probably if you grouped up all of the denominations in the United States and numbered the people, there's major denominations and there's probably more people that believe that tongues have been done away with or that they ceased, then they are people who still believe. I mean, we're gaining and have gained, and I don't know. I, I don't really know the numbers. That we might have surpassed. But First Corinthians chapter 13, here are the, those who, who believe in the ceasing. This is where they, they come from. First Corinthians chapter 13, verses 8, and we'll read down. Verse 8 says, Charity or love never faileth, but whether they be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether they be tongues, they shall cease. Whether they be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect, the word there is complete, is come, then that which is in part shall be done away with. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then, important word, face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. So the, the, the major teaching, the major thought is uh, whether they be prophecies, they'll cease. Whether they be tongues, they'll vanish away because when that which is perfect is come. And so commentary after commentary after commentary in your Bible store will tell you that that after the first church, when the canon of Scripture was complete, when they had a complete Bible, that they no longer needed tongues, now we got a Bible. And so tongues ceased when the Bible was complete. And um, I said last Sunday morning, that's a cruel joke to put something on the menu and not be in the kitchen cooking it. Amen, everybody. Yeah, Jesus put it in here for us to read and taste, but not not experience it. I don't I don't believe that. But anyway, uh, but my only hang up with that is if uh, if prophecies have ceased and if tongues have vanished away, I'm I'm, I'm up in verse eight. Uh, verse eight: Prophecies shall fail, tongues shall cease, and knowledge shall vanish away. Knowledge vanishes away at the same time tongues vanishes away. So if tongues have ceased, then every one of us are big idiots because there's no knowledge. Do y'all see what I'm saying? And there's no sense in having colleges and Bible colleges and uh, seminaries because if, knowledge, if tongues cease, knowledge cease, there's no hope of us having any knowledge. No, it all ceased. Then we shall see face to face. This scripture is saying that when Jesus shows up and we're in his presence, then I won't need to be speaking in tongues. Then I won't need to have a word of knowledge. Then I won't need to hear a prophecy because I'm with him and I'll know as I'm known. When we were, but until Jesus shows up, Remember last week we were looking First Corinthians. He said, "I want to I want to establish you in some gift, so that you come behind in nothing until the coming of the Lord Jesus, signifying that these gifts function until Jesus appears." So we're in the same church age. All of these gifts started in the Book of Acts church age, and they will continue until Jesus sets the millennium kingdom down. Same dispensation. All of them are still going on. Now, 
Go with me over to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and, and we're just going to pick this whole chapter apart. i got about 30 minutes to do it in, and maybe it'll help you to understand some confusing scriptures. But to understand chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians, you have to clue in on verse 26. Read that verse first, and you'll understand the reason for the whole chapter of 1 Corinthians. This was a church that had some problems. The church at Corinth was all out of order. And Paul said in verse 26, How is it, brethren, when you come together, every one of you has a psalm. Everybody's got a doctrine. Everybody's got a gift of tongues happening. Everybody has a revelation. That's a a wisdom or a knowledge gift. Everybody has an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. He said, what in the world is going on in your church? Y'all come together and have church, and just everybody gives out a message in tongues. Everybody prophesies. Everybody does. Uh, it's one big mess. How are you doing this? He said, do things to edify. Now, that's right in the middle of this chapter. So he's addressing their flaw you understand that chapter 14 is written around that one statement. How is it that y'all got this mess going on? And so everything that he's saying, he's addressing to that statement. So we'll go back and start with verse 1, and we'll read Paul's discourse. And a lot of it has to do with the gifts of the Spirit and, and tongues and prophecy in particular. Let's just read it, and I'll comment it as we go. Chapter 14, verse 1. Follow after charity. Follow after love. Desire spiritual, and notice the word gifts is italicized again. Desire spiritual manifestations is what he said. Desire spiritual gifts. But rather that you may prophesy. Prophesying, he said, is the best one out of the bunch. For, watch now. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men. Well, let's stop right there. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men. What kind of tongue is he talking about? Because if it's the gift of tongues, you speak to everybody. I'm going to show you in a minute. And you interpret it so everybody can interpret it. So if he's speaking in an unknown tongue and he's not speaking to men, it's not the gift of tongues. Do you all see what I'm saying? The gift of tongues is always God through me to the church. Just the Holy Ghost praying through me is always The Holy Ghost threw me tongues to God. But tongues out of me to the church is the gift of tongues. And he says here, look carefully, says, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto God. I mean, not unto men. That's not the gift of tongues. The gift of tongues is God speaking to men. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. No man understandeth him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. Uh, there in the Greek it says, in the Spirit he's speaking um, sacred mysteries. He's speaking spiritual and eternal truths. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. That's not the gift of tongues. That's him praying in tongues, him worshiping in tongues. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification exhortation, and comfort. What's a prophecy? Let me, let me say this, and I, I, you'll hear me over the next few weeks repeat a few things, but as I go, I need to do it. Uh, prophecy, the pure gift of prophecy there is for edification, exhortation, and comfort. Prophecy is a dime. The gift of tongues is a nickel. The gift of interpretation is a nickel. They equal the same. But he's saying, it's just best to, you know, you, you can just, through the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, prophesy, edification, exhort. You know when somebody addresses the church, does say the Lord, and it has the, uh, the inspiration, the breath of God on it, that's the easiest way for God to edify the church. To get the prophecy is for edification, exhortation, and comfort. It's better for you to address the church and edify the church than for you to sit in your chair and not speak unto men, but speak unto God in tongues. If you're speaking unto God in tongues, and it's just between you and God, you edifying yourself, I'm going to show you. But if you prophesy or you, get, you flow in the gift of tongues and interpret it, you edify everybody. And so God's saying it's better to edify everybody 
than it is for you just to edify yourself. Now, look, look at verse 4. Here it is again. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. And see, people who don't believe in tongues say, see, somebody speaking in tongues, they're just bragging on themselves. They're trying to make themselves look important. I've had, I've had men with doctors of theology tell me that's what it says. They just, they edify in themselves. They're trying to prove they're something. They're trying to know. The book of Jude says, but ye, beloved, praying in, in, in the Holy Ghost, but you building yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Um, he that, he that, Speaketh in a tongue edifies. The Greek word there is like a battery charger, charging something up. You build yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, Jude said. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifies himself. He charges himself up. Y'all see what I'm saying? Have you ever had a bad day, a bad week, a bad month? And, and the Holy Spirit would pray through you and you felt better about it when it was over? He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. He's building, himself, he's exercising his spiritual muscles. But he that prophesieth edifieth the church. Paul's simply saying, one thing's good for you. One thing's good for everybody. Y'all see that? Look what he says in verse 5. In verse 5 he says, I would that you all spake with tongues. What tongues is he talking about here? I'm going to show you. I would that you all spake with tongues, but rather that, that you prophesied. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except the interpreted, that the church may receive edify. Let me, let me tell you what he just said. He said, man, I wish all of you was baptized in the Holy Ghost and prayed in tongues. But it's, it's, I, I, I wish every one of you would, could pray in tongues. But it's better if you prophesied for the church to receive edification. And even better than that, it's better that if you speak in tongues, it's a gift of tongues, and you interpret it for the church to receive edification. But I ain't got nothing against all of you having the Holy Ghost and praying in tongues. Y'all see that? See what he said? Look at it again. He said, I would that you all spake with tongues. Now, let me tell you how I know that's not the gift of tongues. Because it says, for to one is given this gift, for to one is given that gift, to another is given that gift. The Spirit divides them severally as he will. Paul wouldn't say, I wish that everybody had the gift of tongues, because he knows from his own revelation, his own writings, not everybody's going to have the gift of tongues. Why would he say, I wish everybody had the gift of tongues? When he knows that the Spirit divides several as he wills, and ones give this, ones give that, and you might have the gift of faith or the gift of the word of knowledge and never flow in the gift of tongues. So when he said, I would that you all pray with tongues, he wasn't talking about the gift of tongues. He was talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit and pray it in tongues. Does that make sense? Y'all are looking at me like a cow looking at the barn door open. Is everybody okay? Elder Ed got his thumb up. I'm all right. Now watch. Verse 6. Now, brethren, if I come speaking unto you, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what I profit you except I speak to you either by revelation, that's the Greek word, unless I interpret it, or knowledge, that's your gift, or by prophesying, or by doctrine. If I just come in to you, if I come in, if somebody comes into the church, interrupts the service, starts blurting out in tongues, directs everybody's attention to them, and don't interpret it, what good did you do? You cause confusion. Amen. We had a little situation a couple of months ago, three months ago where I was up preaching and someone blurted out in tongues and, 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 and thank God somebody rescued her and, and interpreted it. But the beginning of that was out of order. The rescue was in order. But the beginning of it was out of order because one gift never interrupts another gift. Are y'all with me? Yeah, gifts don't fight each other. 
And so he's saying, if you come in and blurt out something, and then you don't even interpret it, we're going to see in a minute, if you give out a message in tongues, you're also responsible to interpret it if nobody else does. You can't interrupt the service and give out a message in tongues and then nobody interpret it and you go home and say, well, I know God spoke to me. I guess, I guess somebody else missed him. No, you missed him. Because if nobody interprets it and you gave it, you're responsible with God to interpret it. I'm going to show you here in a few minutes. Watch this. Now, brother, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, while well, I prophet you. And, and, and then verses 7 through uh, the next five or six verses, he's really dealing with that question in verse 26. How come when y'all come together, all this is going on? He's really dealing with it even before he asked him the question. With that question, how is it when you come together? Read these verses. Read 7 down. Watch him set that question up. He says, even things without life given a sound whether pipe or a harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall that be known what is pipe? You don't need no goofy person speaking in tongues and not interpreting it. Then, for if a trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to battle? Likewise, ye except you utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall that be known what is spoken? For you speaking in the air. That makes sense to me. He's not criticizing speaking in tongues. He's saying don't get goofy. Don't just come in and blurt out something and nobody know what the heck you're saying. If you're going to arrest everybody's attention. Watch now. There, they are, verse 10, they are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, none of them without signification. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice... I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh be a barbarian unto me. That's not condemning tongues. That's just saying, use your common sense, man. Use your common sense. Even so, for as much as you're zealous of spiritual, and those gifts is italicized, as much as you're zealous of spiritual manifestations, the Greek would say, Seek that you may excel to the edifying of the church. We, I've been in churches where the whole purpose was everybody got their big thrills and their jollies just off of the gifts working. And, and you, you felt like you come to a church just so people could prophesy and feel good. And, 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 but he said the whole thing with these gifts is seek to edify the church. It's not so we can see how many gifts can flow in one service. It's not so we can go home and brag and say, man, we got seven of them nine gifts working in our, ooh, what a service we had. They was prophesying, carrying on everybody. At the, well, didn't edify nobody if, you, if you're out of order. Am I making y'all mad? Now watch, watch. He says, he says uh, verse 12, as much as you're a it's a spiritual gift, seek that you may excel to the edifying of the church. Then look what he says. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. What tongue is he talking about? This ain't me praying in tongues. This is the gift of tongues. Because the gift of tongues has to be interpreted. Notice he's talking about different kind of tongues in one concourse here. Let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. That's the gift of tongues. If you speak, if you speak it, if you address the congregation with it, then you need to interpret it if somebody else don't. Let him interpret it. Verse 14. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. Is that how it works? That's how it works in your personal life, and that's how it would work with the gift of tongues unless it's interpreted. If I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. Fruitful. Let me stop right there a minute and, and, and talk about something. You, your mind has, when you pray in tongues, your mind has absolutely nothing to do with it. And every time you'll see in your Bible where it says unknown tongues, you're, you'll see that the word unknown is italicized because it wasn't in the original text. It's a tongue. 
though we speak with the tongues of men and of angels. It is a language. It's not an unknown language that nobody knows. They put it in there to just help you understand. If you speak it in a tongue by the Spirit of God, you speak it in a language that's unknown to you. Thus, my brain has nothing to do with it, and my spirit is praying. Now, I'm jumping back and forth between the gift and personal, personal tongues. Why would I... Why would the Holy Ghost want to bypass my brain and pray out of my spirit? Go to Romans chapter 8. Go over to Romans chapter 8. I'm coming back right where we're at now. Don't, don't get lost. Go over to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and look at verse uh, look at verse 26. Romans chapter 8. In verse 26, it says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. The word infirmities there is not diseases and sickness. It helps our weaknesses. The Spirit helps our weaknesses. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. Have you ever had a situation in your life when you just didn't know anymore how to pray about it? If you've got, elders got both his hands raised. If you've got a situation in your life right now that you done prayed about, prayed about, prayed about, and you really don't know how to pray about it anymore, be honest and raise your hand. Yeah. All of us do. Well, that's why we need this Holy Ghost. How many believe that when you don't know how to take it any farther, the Holy Ghost knows how to take it farther? And, and and it just might be that the Holy Ghost, let me say this before I read the rest of this verse. It just might be that you don't even realize that whatever demon or devil or situation it is that's binding this up in your life, the Holy Ghost might know exactly, and he might just pray for you and rebuke that very demon that's messing with your family. And, and that's what he says right here. Look in this verse, in verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit helpeth thy infirmities. For we know not what we should pray as we ought, but the Spirit... Itself, I, I, I don't, I like himself, not itself, but, but the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us. Now look real careful. With groanings which cannot be uttered. In the Greek, cannot be uttered, it says, with groanings which are not in your articulate speech. If he groans through me, if he intercedes through me, and something that's not in my my articulate means my mother tongue. If he's praying through me and it's not in my mother tongue, then he's praying in another tongue, right? Y'all with me? If it's not English for me, it's something else. Then the Holy Ghost is praying in tongues through me. Read it real careful. The the Spirit maketh intercession for us with groanings which are not in English. Not in your articulate speech. Listen, whether you realize it or not, you, you, when you get to the end of where you're at, you need the Holy Ghost to take over and pray it on through for you sometimes. And, 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 and if you don't have those times where you get in God's presence, I'm not talking about the gift of the Spirit, I'm talking about your personal prayer now. If you don't have those times where you're at home and you get in worship or get into the Spirit some way and get in God's presence, and just let the Holy Ghost reach up and tear down them strongholds. Because, baby, I can tell you, he can pray. He, listen, the Holy Ghost knows what the devil's going to try next week. And he can go ahead and get you to victory next week before you even realize there's a problem. That's why we need the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost knows that uh, if there's a bad need down on our missions, down on the Dominican Republic, and if something's about to attack one of our churches or one of our pastors or something next week or next month, and we ain't even heard about it yet, but the Holy Ghost knows it, and He can go ahead and pray you up and pray them up in the Holy Ghost before it even happens to them. You might be praying and be praying for somebody in another nation. You in your mind, in your bedroom, minding your business, reading your Bible, he's going to say a little prayer before you go to sleep. And the Holy Ghost begins to intercede through you. And it might not even be for you. It might be for another nation, another person. It might be some little Chinese boy over in a Buddhist camp somewhere. Because the Holy Ghost knows all of it. And so there's Romans chapter 8. And you go back over to Look now, he said the same thing in 1 Corinthians 14 and 14, look at it. 
If I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit's praying. But my understanding is unfruitful. I want my spirit to pray for me because in my spirit's where the Holy Spirit lives. I thought I would have got one head shake, amen, or something. Yeah. I'd rather my spirit pray through me because in my spirit resides the mind of Christ. In my spirit resides the Holy Spirit. In my spirit resides, and in your spirit resides, all of the wisdom of God for your life. And if we can just let the Holy Spirit pray through us, He can pray what needs to be prayed. I challenge you, uh, if you, you baptize in the Holy Ghost, you should make it a practice to let the Holy Spirit pray through you every day of your life. Mike? Amen. You can feel it when it happens, can't you? So that brings me to right, brings me right to where I'm going. You just one step ahead of me. Watch this. Uh, if if the Holy Spirit prays through me, just what Mike just said. Go back over to Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah chapter 28, verse. Uh, 11 and 12. Somebody said, ah, oh, that, that tongue stuff's not in the Old Testament. Well, yes, it is. Isaiah chapter 28. Go to verse 9. Verse 9, whom shall he teach knowledge? Whom shall he make to understand doctrine? How many of y'all know when you got baptized in the Holy Ghost, your Bible changed? And just, I mean, bam, all of a sudden... There was more to it, and you understood it. It says, Them that are weaned from the milk, drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. Oh, look, for with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. This was a prophecy of the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Most of the Jews never would receive it, and he, he deals with that in advance. But look what he says. Verse 12, to whom he said, this is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. Yet they, the Jewish nation, would not hear. Just what Mike said. When you pray it in tongues and the Holy Ghost prays it through, there's a peace that comes. There's a, there's a, a, a rest when you're weary. There's a refreshing when you've been in the battle and you're hot and you're dry and thirsty. I don't know about you. I can, I can verify in my own life, 34 years of serving Jesus, there's been times when I was weary in well-doing. There's been times when I've been weary in pastoring this church. There's been seasons. We all go through those seasons where, God, where are you? But then there'll come a time where the Holy Spirit will step in and intercede through you, and you'll get that drink of water. You'll get that refreshing, you'll, that weariness of lift. And you'll have a peace that you know, even though nothing around you has changed, that peace that passeth understanding has come because the Holy Ghost has prayed it through for you. I don't know why anybody would not want to believe and being filled with the Holy, precious Holy Spirit and have His help. Jesus says, it's expedient for me to go away. If I go down away, I can't sin. Who? Say it, Donna, say it. The Comforter. He's our helper. He's our Comforter. Why not let Him pray through us? Oh, Brother Steve, you ain't got to that part yet in 1 Corinthians that says, that says it's wrong. Well, let's read on. Go back with me over to 1 Corinthians. Chapter 14. We're just going to finish taking this chapter apart. Verse 14 and 14. If I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit pray and my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I'll pray with the Spirit. That's praying in tongues. I'll pray with the Spirit. That's not the gift of tongues. That's prayer. I will pray with the Spirit. And I'll pray with the understanding also. I'll sing with the Spirit, and I'll sing with the understanding also. How many of you ever get to worshiping, and before you know what, you're singing in tongues? 
I shared with y'all a month so back. I was coming to church. Donna had come on or something. Wasn't with me in the car with me that day. And I just had a lot of liberty. And I was worshiping God. And, and I got to sing it. I didn't mean to, but I got to sing it in tongues. And I sung in tongues about, we lived about 20 minutes away, and I sung about halfway up the interstate in tongues. And when I got off the interstate and got on River Road to come over here, it registered with my mind. Well, I know that tune. I'm singing in tongues, and all of a sudden I realized I'm singing to a tune that I know. And I kept singing in tongues, then I realized the tune I was singing, Oh, when the saints come marching in. I thought, God, God, you've gone crazy. Steve. You're singing when the saints come marching in. I don't know, but i tell you this. I, it sure did refresh me before I got to church that morning. If you don't have that experience in the Holy Ghost, it ain't hard. He said, I'll sing in tongues and I'll sing my understanding. Just sometimes when you're worshiping Him, just instead of telling Him I love you, I thank you, I'm glad to be saved, just worship Him in tongues. Y'all think I'm crazy, don't you? Amen. Amen. The language of the Spirit. Sing in the Spirit. He says, let me just read on. He says, uh, verse 15, what is it? I'll pray with the Spirit. I'll pray with the understanding. I'll sing with the Spirit. I'll sing with the understanding. Else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he occupy the room of the unlearned? Say, Amen, if thou given of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest. Okay, now he's flipped on us and going back dealing with a gift. Paul was great in this chapter at flipping for you knew what he's talking about. For thou verily givest thanks well. See, he's talking about when you, he says, but when you bless in the Spirit those that occupy the room. Now it's not you praying to God. You done talked to the whole church. When you talk, again, when you address the whole church, that's a different thing than you praying and you worshiping. For you give thanks well, but to others not edified. Verse 18, Paul said, I thank my God. I speak, I speak with tongues more than y'all. He's southern. More than you all. I speak more, uh, more than you all. Look what he says. Yet in the church, I had rather speak five words of my understanding that by my voice I might teach others than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. See, Paul hated tongue talking in the church. N- no. He just said, you come in here and talk 10,000 words in tongues and nobody understands it. What good is it? Brethren, be not children in understanding. Howbeit in malice be children, but in understanding be men. For it is written, in the law it is written, I just read it to you, with men of other tongues was over in Isaiah. In other lips will I speak unto this people, yet for all that they will not hear me, saith the Lord. Now watch. Wherefore tongues are for a sign. Not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. Let me address that. Tongues are a sign. That must be Jesus calling him. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign. <laughs> not for them that believe, but to them that believe not. What happened on the day of Pentecost? When that 120 comes spilling out of that upper room. They just got baptized in the Holy Ghost. They were all speaking in tongues. And that whole group of thousands of people were standing around seeing that 120 speak in tongues. And, and, and when they said, what, what shall we do? Here's what they said. Because we hear them speaking the wonderful gospel and the glory of God in our own language. When he says tongues are for a sign, he's referring to the incident of and when and if. You're praying in tongues. You are praying in tongues. They weren't operating in the gift of tongues on the day of Pentecost. They were just baptized in the Holy Ghost. And they was worshiping God in tongues. They was just praising God and worshiping God in tongues. But everybody that was standing around understood. I mean, if I'm standing around and I'm a Greek, and this Jew's speaking in an unknown tongue to him, but he's speaking in Greek, well, that's my mother language. I understand what he's saying. Uh, we had, my, my dad had an incident. He was in a big church of God. And he used to attend before God delivered him. But... Uh, and uh, he gave out a message in tongues and interpreted it. There was a family there from Saudi Arabia who business partners visiting. They understood everything he said. 
They understood that he translated it perfectly with the interpretation. They didn't know. They thought he had read the Bible out loud and, and, and put it back in English. And they got home with the family at lunch that they was with visiting the church and got to question it. And, 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 and around that family's kitchen table, these Muslims accepted Jesus and got saved because when Dad gave out the message in tongues and interpreted it, he spoke directly to what was going on in their life. So, you speaking in tongues ain't going to convince me. I'm already a believer. But if you speak it in my mother tongue and I hear it, that's going to get my attention. Amen. That's all that's saying. That's all that is saying. Now, let me read on. What verse was I in? I'm, uh, where am I at? I'm down in uh, verse 22. Wherefore tongues are for a sign not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. Now watch. Prophesying serveth not to them that believe not, but to them that believe. You stand up in the church under the unction of the anointing of God and prophesy something, and I'm not a believer. I might think, look at that goof head. But if I'm a believer, and the Spirit of God in me is quickened by what the Spirit of God says to you, then I'll believe it. Everybody see that? Verse 23. If therefore the whole church come together in the one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, what well, do I all say you're mad? I'd say, I think you're crazy if I come in and everybody's giving out a message in tongues and nobody's interpreting it. I'd say, this is a big old red hot mess. But if all prophesy and there come in one that believeth not or unlearned, he is convinced of all, convicted is the word. He is judged of all. Watch this. And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. Falling down on his face, he'll worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. I have seen that happen over and over and over again. Some unsaved person comes in and a word comes through somebody and it addresses exactly what's going on in their life. And they know God's talking to them. Have you ever come to church and the gift of the Spirit speak to you personally? Hang around. It'll happen. How is it then, brethren, we read it earlier, verse 26, you come together, every one of you has a psalm, a doctrine, a tongue, let all things be done unto the order. And I want to get to verse 27 and 28. It's important that we get to, to these two verses before we go home. i got two minutes. I might take three. If any man, watch this, if any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most three, that by course, and let one interpret it. What, what, hold up. If it's got to be interpreted, then it's the gift of tongues, right? The gift of tongues is what's interpreted. And, and he's addressing, if you're going to address the congregation, if any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most three, not the whole church, and that by course, not on top of each other. It means In the Greek, it means one at a time. Do this thing in order. If the gift of the Spirit... The gift of tongues manifest. Do it in order, one at a time, and let one interpret. That's pretty simple. But, and then he says, look at verse 28. But if there be no interpreter, here's the key to that. If you ain't going to interpret it, and nobody else can interpret it, then you don't need to be flowing in that gift, because you're going to cause confusion. And I'm going to call you down. Because I've been around a long time, and I don't mind embarrassing somebody if they're all wacky. Yes, sir, I'll embarrass you. You're not embarrassed yourself, but you ain't going to make me and this church look foolish. Amen. You hear what I'm saying? We ain't going to have that. But he, said, he says, um, if there be no interpreter in the watch, let him keep silent in the church. See, Brother Steve, should nobody should never speak in tongues unless it's interpreted. And I've had unbelieving people come in out of service and hear you worshiping God in tongues. Or maybe I got happy preaching and said a syllable in tongues. And they grabbed me at the door with this very scripture. Y'all are out of order. They spoke in tongues and the Bible says, if there's no interpreter, keep silence and don't speak in the church. <laughs> Look what it says. Look, read what it said. If there be no interpreter... Let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Now, how am I going to keep silent and how am I going to speak? 
Isn't that kind of confusing? Look at what it says in the Greek. If there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church. Here's what it says in the Greek. Go check me out. I mean, it's real simple. You can get a $14 Strong's Concordance, and this is what I tell you. I ain't, this ain't no deep, hard to find. He says, let him keep silence in the church. Let him keep it close to himself. Don't address the whole church. If your tongue is not a gift of tongues that's to be interpreted for the whole church to hear, but then it says, let him speak to himself and to God. Speak to God in tongues, in church. Just keep it close to you. Don't address the whole church. Now, let me tell you something. If I'm sitting right here and I'm praying and worshiping in tongues, and Barry's sitting behind me, and he hears me. I'm not out of order because he heard me, and I didn't interpret it. He just heard me praying and worshiping in tongues. I kept it close to me. The brother back over here probably didn't hear it. I'm in order. It's me and God. Let him speak unto himself and unto God. I, listen, if you come up on me and hear me talking to God, and you hear me talking to God, I, I can't do nothing about that. But now, if I jump up and talk to all of y'all, and everything else is going on, I pull everybody's attention to me and my tongue. That better be a gift of tongues, and somebody, me first, better interpret it. You will see in this church, if someone gives out a gift in tongues, and we lull a little while, and we're waiting for it to be interpreted. And I know it's all, it ain't always the same person, it could be somebody else, Right? But if that thing rocks on too long, you will see your pastor start looking at the person that gave it out like, that's you. You better ask God to give you the interpretation right now. Because you're going to go home with egg on your face and I ain't going to cover for you. Amen? So let, let me read that to you again. Let's just read them two verses. If you speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three. And that by course, take turns. And let somebody interpret it. Let one interpret it. That's the gift of tongues. If there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church. Let him keep it close to himself. Don't address the whole church. That's what it says. Keep it close to you. Don't address everybody. And, and then it says, and let him speak to himself and to God. Let him speak to himself and to God. Was he speaking to himself in verse 2? Remember what we said? We said if he's speaking in a tongue, he's speaking in mysteries. He's just praying the sacred truths and the revelations of the Spirit of God that God wants to have happen in his life. Can I take two more minutes? Look at verse 29. Let the prophet speak two or three. Let the others judge. I need to just finish these next two verses. Let the others judge. If anything be revealed to another that setteth by, let the first hold his peace. You ain't the only one God can use. Shut up if God's using somebody else. And then it says in verse 31, For you, you may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be confident. Now, I've had brothers come in here and say, Everybody in here can prophesy. Prophesy. You can prophesy. You may all prophesy. You may all prophesy. That is not what that says. Well, but Steve, you just read it. It says you may all prophesy. Look at it in the original text, and then look at it this way. The Bible plainly says, For to one is given the gift of tongues, to one is given the gift of interpretation, to another prophecy, the Spirit divides these severally as He wills to who He wants to have them. In the original text, what it says is, All of you who have the gift of prophecy can prophesy. Not everybody has the gift of prophecy. If I don't have the gift of prophecy... I don't need to be trying to prophesy. That's right. Hello, everybody. You need to know if God's using you and how God's using you. I know how God can use... When God does you, I'm not all that much... I'm a, my primary giftings are teaching and pastoring. And from time to time, if the Holy Ghost hits me just right, I can flow in the gift of the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge. I don't try to give out a, a tongue and an interpretation because I've never been used. I'm not saying I couldn't, but I, that ain't something God's ever used me in. I've prophesied a few times, but I don't have the gift of healings. We're going to talk about that, even though you can pray for healing without the gift. 
But not, when he says you may all prophesy, don't get caught up into this ultra charismatic stuff where everybody can prophesy and they'll come together and all 50 people in mom and them's church will take turns prophesying. That ain't what that says. That says if everybody's got that gift can, can do it. And all of you have been in situations where you've seen what I'm talking about. And, and half the time it's wacky. Then it says in verse 32, and the spirits of the owner, I got to hit this, and the spirits of the prophet are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Let me tell you what that simply means. The spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophet. I said a moment ago, one gift don't interrupt the anointing of another gift. The spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophet. We had a little situation several months ago, uh, a couple of times, where a particular person just interrupted the preaching. Just bam, right in the middle of what I was doing. To, to, and, and we had several conversations, and this person's thought was, well, when God moves on me, I'm going to be obedient to God. The spirit of the prophets... Are subject to the prophet. Mike Duke and I had this conversation. My dad and I have had this conversation. I've had these conversations with lots of other people. When God's using you in a gift, you will know that that gift is activated and stirred. You'll be in a church service and you will know, boy, this thing's about to bust out. But you will also be in order and not cause confusion and not stop one thing that God's doing to do the thing you want God to do to you. You will wait till it's applied. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. Do everything in order. Amen. That's all he was saying. That's all he was saying. And if you're out of order, I want the gifts of the spirit, y'all. I want the gifts of the spirit. But I'm too old. And I still got too many rough edges on me to put up with foolishness. And this person that, that I had to talk to that was interrupting me while I was preaching did not like it. Adamantly disagreed with me. Brother Steve, when God moves on me, I'm going to move right there. And I said, well, God just moved you to another church. Because you ain't doing it in my church in the middle of me preaching. Or somebody else up doing something, ministering. And if there's another gift flowing, your gift thing will jump on top of their gift. Because God's not the God of confusion. Everything's done in order. So thank you. When you have to move, when you have to move, then you have to move, baby. <laughs> That's just what it is around here. Amen. That's called order. Amen. So we started tonight on tongues. Next week I'll, I'll finish up on the gift of tongues. Tongues in our life, and we'll pull in prophecy with it. And I'll show you all through the Bible. I'm going to give you some examples in the Bible where that gift of prophecy were. By the time we finish this series, as you read the Bible, you'll be looking at the stories in the Bible differently because you'll go, oh, that was the gift of healing. Oh, that was the work of the miracles. Oh, that was the word. When Jesus said to the woman at the well, you've had five husbands, and the one you got now is not your husband, that was simply the word of, a word of knowledge. But you'll begin to see all that when you when you when you get through studying these gifts. I hope. Amen.